and uh, welcome to the 2020 uh, Myers Lecture Series interview with Dr. Edwin Marshall. I'm Dr. Jeff Myers. My wife Joyce and I sponsor the Myers Lecture Series, now honoring our 12th lecturer this year. Dr. Marshall, it's a privilege and uh, to have you with us and an honor to have you as part of our Myers Lecture Series. Thank you very much. And actually, it's a privilege and an honor for me to be here. Uh, we're, we're just thrilled to have you here. So as you all know, we're already we're all participating virtually this year. For all of our participants, know that you can ask questions during the lecture through the chat feature in our Zoom webinar. Now we'll be monitoring those questions and we will ask those of Dr. Marshall after the interview. We also plan to be hoping to accept some live questions from the audience if time permits. So with that, I'd like to uh, share with our uh, group and our family, Dr. Marshall, a little bit about you. Uh, many of them know you probably quite well, but uh, for those who don't, it's important that they know a little bit about you. So I wanna share information. Uh, you graduated from Indiana University with not one degree, but with four degrees, two bachelor's degrees, a master's in the OD degree, and then received a master's in public health from the University of North Carolina. And either you liked Bloomington, Indiana or Indiana University liked you, I don't know which, or maybe both, because you stayed there for your career, um, mostly at the School of Optometry, but ultimately being named the Indiana University Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Multicultural Affairs. Quite, a, quite a, a, an accomplishment for an optometrist. We're thrilled about that. Now you held professor appointments in three of the schools and colleges there on campus, Optometry, Public Health, and Medicine. And you also served optometry schools in Malaysia, Denmark, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, England, and India. As I went through your CV, the list of state, national, and international committees, commissions, and appointments is just really too long to even uh, mention, and really almost too, too numerous to even try to highlight uh, some of those positions. But as I looked at them, the focus seemed to be on public health, manpower issues, and minority representation here in the United States and on development of the profession across the globe. You've served as a past chair of the board of the American Public Health Association, past president of the Indiana Optometric Association, and past president of the National Optometric Association, where you've served in some form or fashion virtually throughout your career. Now, service of that measure certainly doesn't go without its accomplishments in terms of recognition. You've been recognized by the National Optometric Association and the American Optometric Association as their optometrist of the year. You're a diplomat of the public health and environmental optometry section of the American Academy of Optometry and have received the Carol C. Koch Memorial Medal from the Academy. You've been inducted into the National Optometry Hall of Fame, the distinguished practitioner and fellow within the National Academies of Practice. And uh, as I was reviewing again, this 47 page CV that you have, which is monumental and wonderful and not to minimize any of those recognitions, but I, I saw more recognitions with the term distinguished next to them than probably most people could even name. So uh, it was quite a, quite a series of accomplishments. But two recognitions seem to be, uh, to be highlighted just here in the last year or so. Uh, the Indiana University has recognized you with their Distinguished Inclusive Excellence Award and their Distinguished Alumni Service Award. So to me, that's a pretty impressive series of accomplishments uh, and congratulations on all of them. But the fact of the matter is we want to know a little bit more about you and how you became, came to become such a high achiever. And so with that, I just have a few questions I want to ask and just kind of get your responses to. So I want to know why it is you chose optometry. You know, why what drew you to this profession? Obviously, you would have been an achiever anywhere you went. But why optometry? And why the shift and decision to get a master's of public health a few years into, into your career? Actually, uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I don't think I chose optometry per se. Um, optometry, was, optometry was not on my radar screen until I think uh, towards the end of my senior undergrad year. And it just so happens, in fact, in fact, at that time, I was more interested in becoming a geneticist. Um, I think during my, my junior year, I had taken a, an elective course in genetics. I majored in zoology as an undergrad. Uh, which is now biology. 
But I majored in zoology. I took uh, my first course in genetics, got really turned on, fired up, you know, counting Drosophila and, and doing genetic mappings and really got to the point where I thought that might be a, a good career for me. Just so happens that, um, in fact, uh, your former um, dean, uh, Mel Ship and I were undergrads together. Mel and I were sitting, um, I think, over lunch one day. Uh, this is probably, oh, maybe a month before graduation. And asked me had I thought about optometry. And I really had not, uh, even though, you know, I'd had an eye exam as a, as a, as a child. But since then, you really no contact uh, whatsoever. And Mel at the time, was, I believe, was doing work study for a professor in optometry who just happened to be uh, head of the admissions committee. And Mel says, well, how I kind of set you up for, you know, for an interview and just go in and talk and see what happens. You know, you can't hurt. And I kind of agreed. Yeah, fine. And so I said, okay. So I went over, met with Dr. Strickland. Gerald Strickland at the time, uh, who ultimately became, I think, uh, a dean at Houston. And we talked. And again, having majored in zoology, mining in chemistry, and anatomy physiology, you know, I had a slew of science courses. You know, and I, I satisfied all the requirements uh, unknowingly, you know, for optometry, but had done it anyway. And after reviewing my transcript and looking things over, we had about a two-hour, maybe two-hour conversation interview. Well, at the end of that discussion, I was already signed up for my first uh, geometric optics class that summer. So what turned out to be kind of an exploratory uh, conversation about optometry, next thing I know, you know, I'm becoming an optometrist. Now, going into it blindly, again, not knowing a whole lot about the profession, but what I'd heard kind of interested me and excited me to, to a certain degree. And so I decided to go ahead and pursue this Trying to explain what I was going to do to my mother uh, was also another challenge. Um, but, you know, she finally uh, came around and agreed that it was my decision. And, but what I found uh, most challenging was that my first year, most of my classmates had some familiarity with optometry. You know, their father, their mother, their cousin, their brother, their sister, somebody. So they had an idea of what to expect, what, what the curriculum was about. Um, instrumentation. I remember we were talking about um, retina scopes and ophthalmoscopes, and I had no clue what they, what they were. And so luckily, I had some pretty supportive classmates, and they kind of led me through the process. So over the course of, of, of my, of my uh, optometry schooling, I became really, you know, engrossed in the profession, um, totally um, by accident, essentially, uh, by accident that Mel and I happened to sit down one day and have that uh, conversation. So I often credit, you know, my being in optometry uh, to Dr. Ship. Well, good. For, I love that story. That's a great story. We'll get back to Dr. Ship maybe in just a little bit. Why the MPH? Um, when I graduated, at the time um, I was I was married. My, my my wife was in law school. There was a year difference between us in terms of graduation dates. So she said, "Well, find something to do, you know, for a year to buy some time." My plan was to go to Atlanta to go into practice. I had already arranged uh, to go into practice with the ophthalmologist in Atlanta. Uh, we had uh, built an office, uh, but she convinced me to kind of stay in Bloomington until she finished her uh, law degree. So in talking with, uh, I, I talked with um, the dean and he agreed, well, we put you, put you to work in the clinic for a year and then you can go and do what you, want, what you need to do. During, that, during the course of that year, I got the opportunity to um, co-author a grant with uh, Dr. Bennett uh, to establish a clinic. Uh, at the time, we only had one optometry clinic, and that was on campus. And in those days, there was a pretty strong uh, town-gown sort of schism. Um, city people were not comfortable coming on campus and going to uh, the campus clinic. So we were seeing a lot of young myopes uh, in our clinics. But more, more importantly, uh, there, was a, there was a significant portion of the population that was underserved, that was not being seen. So this clinic was designed to serve those most vulnerable, those who were underserved. And we placed this in an area of Bloomington that had been traditionally underserved. Um, 
and we, uh, we, we, got, we got funded, uh, not a lot, but enough to at least, at least get started. So we converted an old garage and a lot of borrowed equipment. Um, and we began to you know, start serving uh, this, this population. And I learned then that, uh, that there were people out there who really needed care, but were not having good access to care. And there were a lot of services, support services, that need to be kind of brought together, coalesced uh, to help these people um, access and also to, to, to cover the cost of their services. So I got involved with a lot of community organizations, uh, trying to find ways of supporting uh, their, their care. And this all kind of began to percolate inside me uh, around, around issues of access. And so there was kind of a, something missing. I had an OD, OD degree, but still there was something missing. And I decided ultimately, you know, to take a sabbatical and go to Chapel Hill and, and get an MPH in health policy. That basically um, caused me to make a significant turn in my career trajectory. Uh, I now started moving more in terms of public health, particularly around access issues, around equity issues. Um, now, behind this, I still had kind of a uh, underpinning for uh, trying to do more about increasing uh, representation, minority representation within the profession. And I kind of dovetail, dovetail those two um, missions uh, to, together. But I think it was that early experience um, establishing that clinic, identifying a need, being able to serve a population that was totally unlike anything we were seeing uh, throughout my training. And I remember uh, I told the clinicians, uh, I, when, when they came to that facility, you know, leave the white coats home, take off the ties. Uh, I want you to be on the level of the patients that, that you're gonna serve. And I, I don't want you to act like you're above them. I want you to meet them where they are. And I think it was a, it was a tremendous learning experience, not only in terms of clinical care, but in terms of developing uh, humility about how you go about uh, interacting with people who may not necessarily uh, look like you, or act like you, or be, or be of the same uh, economic uh, level as you. Interesting. Well, and I think I, I think on behalf of the profession, we're delighted that public health became the focus of your career, and uh, and it become, you become the expert and the spokesman, if you will, for for those issues uh, for a good portion of the profession. So, if it was an optometry. You think you would have been this geneticist that you had planned to be, or what do you think? That was my direction, uh, except there was a little issue going on at the time called um, uh, Vietnam. Right. And um, I'm not sure because going into grad school actually would not have um, given me a deferment. Uh, so I'm not too sure what would have happened had, had Mel not come along with that optometry idea. Um, my life has been pretty much serendipitous, so I'm sure some some new fork in the road would have would have uh, miraculously uh, appeared, and uh, I would have probably you know uh, made made a, a choice that hopefully would have worked out. But it's hard to say. I really don't know. That's okay. So I'm kind of curious. You know, as we talk to folks who are high achievers, I'm always curious what motivates them. It kind of sounds like, to at least what you've said thus far, it sounds like the opportunity to bring services and, and benefits to people who are underprivileged or underserved, maybe it, but maybe it's something else. What really motivates you? You probably hit it. Um, early on in my life, you know, it was instilled in me as a, as a child that uh, you always want to kind of reach back. You always want to help people along. And um, I think uh, that sort of inward passion uh, probably pushed me uh, to do to do uh, what I did, uh, I always felt uh, the need to 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 help uh, when and wherever I could, um, and I think uh, my mother was always pushing me to to to, to improve myself uh, so that I can improve uh, the lives of, of others as, as well, and I think that was my driving uh, motivation. And then coming out of um, an area I was born. I was born in the South. Uh, in fact, I was born into into the Jim Crow South, and seeing a lot of the inequities that existed, you know, at that time in my life, uh, I think that helped also shape some of that motivation. 
um, being once I had the opportunity uh, to be able to try to address you know, some of those inequities. And since I was in optometry, it seemed somewhat logical to me that I tend to focus on inequities around, around healthcare. And so I think that was probably the, the most motivating factor. And you've cer certainly seen a lot of change in your lifetime uh, in terms of uh, how, how people were treated early on in the Jim Crow era and then today in some ways we're better and in some time, some ways maybe we're not any better, but you know, it certainly has been some change over the years, that's for sure. Who were, you mentioned your mom, but who were early influencers or mentors in your life? Were that, was it just family or were there other people in your, in, in your sphere of influence who were early influencers or mentors? I think, um... As a, as a youngster, I think my mother was probably the most um, uh, important in terms of mentoring me to, 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 to go forward. But I do recall that uh, in third grade, it was a third grade teacher. This is Flag, I'll never forget her. Uh, she was one who actually kind of uh, uh, put, the, put, put, the, put the match to my fire. Um, you know, and my mother was a school teacher, so she was always reporting back to my mother as to how I was doing and making sure that uh, I was always uh, doing what I should be doing. And if I didn't, she was going to tell my mother, and that wasn't wasn't going to turn out very good for me. Um, I think she was an early um, motivator. And then in high school, my Spanish teacher, uh, Mrs. Birnbaum, I'll never forget her as, as well. Um, and it seems interesting that was a Spanish teacher who was who was a motivator, but she, but she took an early interest in me. And not only within Spanish class, but also uh, throughout my uh, high school career and, and, and kept pushing me. And every time I saw her, you know, she was always encouraging me to, to, to do more, do more. So I think those were probably, um, as long as my mother, uh, the early uh, uh, mentors. And then um, once I got into, um, Indiana University, I think that uh, my, my genetics professor uh, was probably my, my next uh, closest uh, mentor. And then once in optometry school, uh, there was a He actually uh, asked, called me in one day and sat me down and says, how would you like to go and teach a six-week course in India? And, you know, again, not knowing a whole lot about India, but, but also, you know, being, being somewhat adventuresome. I says, well, why, why not? And spending, spending time over there, um, interacting with a totally new, different population, uh, learning new cultures, uh, being able to reconcile my culture uh, with their culture, um, not only imparting information, but also receiving information. You know, it was, it was a two-way street. In fact, um, I never forget, they told me that, you know, you're kind of like a guru. You're here to teach us, but while you're here, what can we teach you? And I thought that was, that, 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 that was very, very uh, encouraging. So I think Hank Hofstadter was, was, was an early mentor. Uh, Jack Bennett, who was an individual that I co-authored the grant with to start that first clinic, uh, was another one. He taught me also about um, uh, compassion, uh, about being able to uh, want to serve others. Um, and the, the real, I think, uh, impetus behind what it is that we do as public servants, as, as healthcare providers. Um, Dr. Heath, Gordon Heath, who was my first geometric optics teacher, uh, I, know what, I never would have thought at the time of taking GEO that he was going to actually turn out to be a mentor, but he also um, supported me in terms of a lot of my international uh, work and made sure that I had the resources and the time to um, commit uh, to, to that. And then a little bit uh, later, uh, Dr. John Howlett, who actually turned out to be my father-in-law, uh, he and C. Clayton Powell were the first two, uh, well, among, among the, the, the first minority uh, African-American optometrists that I've ever met, both of which were inducted also into the uh, Optometry Hall of Fame, uh, became mentors in a different sort of way. 
uh, along with James Washington, who was a practitioner in New Jersey. Uh, and being from New Jersey, I would always go back and talk to him and he would uh, give me uh, insight as to, you know, what I need to do, what I need to focus on as I, as I move forward. Uh, so I think, you know, those were some of the early ones. Uh, Dr. Robert Johnson from, from Chicago was another one. And all these were kind of part of my <clears throat> informal um, family, uh, optometry family. Uh, and they each had kind of a different purpose or a different function, but collectively, I think they all helped, you know, shape me into, you know, who I actually turned out to be. Very cool. Now, now you mentioned Dr. Powell, and uh, he was obviously part of the early days of the National Optometric Association, and you served as president there. Tell us a little bit about those early days of the NOA. What can you share about that? Well, um, didn't know a whole lot about the NOA early on uh, in my first few years of optometry school. Uh, Nell Ship and I, uh, as, 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 as optometry uh, classmates, along with another student named Calvin Yates, uh, were concerned about the, the, the low representation of minorities within optometry. And so we kind of convinced uh, the school that they should uh, send us on a tour of HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, uh, throughout the South during spring break. Uh, so they allowed us to use a university car, and we took off um, and did uh, use, use our spring break to go and visit these schools to talk about optometry. Now, they told us we could only go but so far. Uh, but and then Dr. Powell was in Atlanta, which was a little bit outside of the sphere that they gave us in terms of our travel uh, radius. But we decided to go ahead and go anyway because we wanted to meet Dr. Powell. We had heard about him, but we wanted to meet him. So we drove uh, to Atlanta, uh, met him at his office, talked with him. He told us that the NOA was going to have its second convention in Chicago uh, that summer, and we should come. Um, so Mel and I uh, decided that uh, that that's, that summer, we actually drove to Chicago and attended the, uh, which, which was then the, the second meeting of the NOA. It was in 1970. And that's when I got to meet, oh, you know, uh, a large number, you know, of, of minority optometrists who I really had no idea even existed. Um, so I got really turned on again by, by, by the NOA and, 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 and by its mission and by its goals and what it tried to accomplish. So when I graduated, um, I attended the next convention. In fact, I think I only missed maybe one convention, uh, convention since 1970. But really got involved, um, and I coupled the mission of the NOA with my mission to also try to increase representation uh, within the profession, and got really involved with a lot of its committees, um, helped help promote some, some of its policies, and decided that um, you know maybe I should try to be a leader within within, within this organization. Uh, I forget. Oh, it, it took took a few years, but ultimately I became I became a president uh, of the NOA. Uh, served for uh, two years in that capacity, but it also was a um, it was it was it was a learning platform for me because not only was I now at, 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 at in the leader of this organization, but it, but it afforded me the opportunity to meet and interact with other leaders from other organizations and also those within um, within politics. You know, because uh, we had you know we would try to affect change in policy. I remember testifying. Uh, before uh, a House committee on um, on looking at uh, a health manpower bill um, as, as a member of the NOA. I remember, you know, entertaining um, various types of policy makers and, and, and various types of conversations around what we need to do to uh, do a better job of, of improving uh, representation. Um, maybe because of my um, presidency on, on, of the NOA, it may have something to do with my being appointed by, um, with then with Secretary Bowen, to the National Advisory Council on Health Professionals Education, which also allowed me the opportunity to try to uh, promote more diversity uh, within healthcare, and more specifically uh, within optometry. So those early days of the NOA, I think um, we, we, we struggled. And I must admit that one of the reasons that the NOA was founded um, was because Dr. Howlett, uh, who actually was my father-in-law, um, was denied membership in the local society of the AOA. 
And because of that, uh, I think he joined the, um, one of the local societies of the Medical Association, interestingly uh, enough. Um, but um, he and Dr. Powell kind of came together with some, with some others and decided that uh, we need to have a voice, a stronger voice. And we need, we need to do that collectively. And the NOA was the vehicle, uh, hopefully, you know, for making that happen. And, um, you know, it was, it was open to anyone, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, exclusive. And we often had the AOA presidents come and attend the meeting. And that, that gave us a chance for, you know, further dialogue around various issues and common issues as well as some, you know, not, not, not so common. Uh, but it got us the opportunity to learn from each other and to support each other um, at a higher level um, beyond just, you know, our immediate interest, but also to help promote uh, optometry um, as, a prof as a profession um, at large. So, um, you know, I, th I think uh, never since my presidency, I, I, I've stayed involved, you know, with NOA. Um, I kind of serve kind of as an unofficial uh, liaison when, when they need me. Um, and uh, we have, again, we have, uh, in, the, in the past few years, we've done, I think, you know, quite a lot in terms of trying to increase the visibility, not only of optometry, but also of the need uh, for various populations to have an eye exam. Uh, to make sure that, you know, they don't um, in increase their, their risk for things like diabetic eye disease or glaucoma uh, because they're most vulnerable. So I, so I think uh, the NOA has a role to play, um, not in competition with AOA or the Academy and anyone else, but in the complementary fashion um, as we move, it to, move it to our profession forward. And, and it's interesting that you mentioned some of those things. I love the story about you and Dr. Ship, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I think that that shows a lot of, um, oh, just leadership to say, hey, you know, let's go do this and let's go see if we can invite some other folks um, who are in the minority group to, to come and be with us and, and be part of the profession. I think that's that's awesome. And, uh, and hats off to you doing doing that at the time that you did. What else could we be doing as a profession or even just Ohio State? What could we be doing better about recruiting minority, uh, specifically African-American uh, uh, students to optometry? Is there anything, is there something we're missing or some, some strategy you could offer there? Well, I think, you know, we, we've tried quite a few uh, different things over the years. Um, and I, I won't say, you know, they were unsuccessful, but I think we need to be a, a lot more aggressive in our approaches. Um, I was fortunate enough to, uh, at, at Indiana to have a summer program for 17 years uh, that was funded by, um, by HRSA, uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration. And that program, uh, I think, was a major source of recruitment, a major portal for bringing uh, minority students into optometry, not only at IU, but, 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 but elsewhere. And I think the primary reason it was so successful was that I did not advertise it as an optometry program. I advertised it as a health professions program. And, and, and kind of leaning back on my story, you know, how I got into optometry, remembering that, you know, I didn't know anything about optometry until, uh, until about two months before I took my first class. There were a lot of people out there who didn't know about optometry, but who had maybe an interest in health in health, in health professions. So we invited anywhere between 45 to 60 students from throughout the country uh, each year to spend six weeks in Bloomington. Uh, and that program was hosted by optometry. I, I employed optometry students as counselors, optometry faculty uh, taught the courses. And, I, and, and so over the course of that 17 years, we were able to bring people into the profession who otherwise might not have known about optometry or at least not having it on their immediate uh, career uh, radar. So I, so I think programs like that have value. And, I, and I'm seeing a kind of somewhat of a resurgence in those summer programs at various uh, institutions. And hopefully, you know, they will uh, show, show, show dividends. We're also seeing several optometry schools now developing relationships with HBCUs, uh, developing, you know, pathways uh, for students to come into um, uh, the profession. One, one, one of the success stories of my program, my, my summer program, was that we developed relationships 
with individuals at a lot of institutions. Now, it took a while to develop those relationships, to develop the trust. But once we did that, individuals, faculty, counselors, they were kind of our face at their respective institutions, and they helped us you know, recruit students. And I think as we develop these pipelines, uh, we will begin to see we begin to see, I think, a, a, a greater return on our efforts because it's going to take a while to kind of build that momentum. But one, I think one of the major problems is that there's basically that there's a lack of familiarity, there's a lack of awareness, there's a lack of knowledge about optometry. And so the more we can do to uh, increase that awareness, but also support that awareness with various programs that will uh, not only bring students into optometry, but support them while they're there. Uh, to develop a sense of community. Um, when I was at IU, you know, when I, when I first entered uh, IU optometry, I was the only African-American in the school. You know, Mel came uh, the year later. Uh, so there's always a sense, kind of a sense of, of isolationism. And, and, and that tends not to bode very well many times in terms of success. So we need to have, uh, we need to have support mechanisms uh, put in place. So I think pipe, you know, uh, more emphasis on, on, emphasis on, on pipelines, uh, developing these relationships with HBCUs, providing support mechanisms within the schools uh, to build a sense of community, of belonging, um, so that we don't feel, you know, isolated. Uh, obviously, you know, increasing faculty, but we, got, we have to, to kind of grow that student pool first, uh, but, you know, uh, increasing minority faculty. I don't know how many times I would have students come into our office, you know, after five o'clock, just want to talk, uh, you know, not having any problems, but just want to sit down and talk with someone who could understand where they were. And so my house was always kind of a, a way station, for, you know, for the minority students back in those days, um, just so that we can have a place to, to come and, and relax and, and feel like we were, in fact, uh, a family. And so I think those are some of the, you know, some of the things that we, we can do. But you know, again, uh, we have to be more aggressive in the process. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm a few years younger than you are, but I would say back in those days, there wasn't a lot of support for anybody within the within the schools. You know, and, and I can appreciate what you're saying, but uh, we've recognized that at least Ohio State has, and has done some things in the last few years to really make sure that um, no students left behind, so to speak. That is to say, every student has got a social connection. Uh, with other students and with a faculty member and that kind of thing, um, which didn't exist when I went to school, you know, I mean, or when you went to school, you just kind of were on your own and hopefully you made it. So um, I think it's, it's good to recognize those things and give, give everybody a sense of community. And, and I think you're right. I think having a sense of community for all of us is a good thing. So I think that's, that's a great suggestion. I think several of those strategies are awesome. So what would you point to as your most lasting or most significant contribution thus far in your career and in your life? Probably several things, I think. Um, that first trip I took to India. Um, and in those days, there wasn't a lot of engagement by U.S. optometry and what was happening around the world in terms of optometry. Um, being able to go and kind of be, you know, at the vanguard of some of that, um, helping, uh, you know, develop the profession on an international scale. I, I, to me, uh, even though that event itself might not necessarily be a legacy, but in, in terms of my personal um, uh, sense, I think for, for me, it, it, it it helped establish a, um, a benchmark for me in terms of where I wanted to go, you know, from there uh, on, on an international scale. Um, you know, developing that, that, that community clinic, uh, even though it's no longer um, uh, around, but I think developing that, being able to provide a service to help people, uh, to train clinicians around how you interact with people who may not necessarily be of the same, you know, culture, or speak the same language, or look like you. Uh, how you interact with them, not only as a as a doctor, but also as a human being. Uh, I think, uh, to me, uh, was 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 kind of a, a legacy. 
um, the Institute, developing that, that, that 17 year stint with my summer program, the people I was able to bring into optometry and to see them flourish and develop. Um, uh, we are, you know, that, that program produced um, other uh, ALA ODs of the year. It produced the state presidents, it produced um, board members, um, state association um, execs. So it, 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 it made a contribution to the profession um, beyond what might not have occurred, you know, but for the, you know, them coming into optometry. And I think also um, probably one of my, uh, maybe one of my proudest um, uh, moments was when the president of Indiana University uh, made the decision that we need to have a school of public health. And Indiana did not have a school of public health at the time. And he decided that we were gonna have two, not just one, but two. We we're gonna have one in Bloomington and one in Indianapolis. And he asked me to basically oversee that mission, oversee that charge. Um, so over the course of several years, it was my responsibility to uh, convince uh, the, the Higher Education Commission, convince the Board of Trustees, convince um, the crediting bodies um, that you know, we need to have these schools and how they were gonna function uh, together uh, uh, collaboratively and to see them through from, from, from the early stages through uh, accreditation. So having that sort of legacy um, to me, uh, going back to my public health bent, you know, starting off in public health, uh, I probably should mention that, you know, when I attended my first uh, meeting of the American Public Health Association, I was constantly asked, you know, what is an optometrist doing at a public health meeting? Um, so, and to go from that moment in time to where now I'm kind of spearheading the development of two schools of public health at a major university, to me, I think, uh, was, a, it was a, an accomplishment and a memory, you know, that I will continue to cherish. Well, and certainly an influential change that you ended up making as a result of that. And, you know, you make uh, the profession proud when you do that kind of stuff. And I think that's just great. So, so you've already mentioned Dr. Ship a couple of times. And uh, clearly from the times you've mentioned him, it sounds like your close colleagues and schoolmates and that kind of thing, and certainly the influencer for your decision to optometry. Um, and if you did a road trip with him throughout the South, I'm going to guess there's stories that you could tell about him, uh, maybe from that time, maybe from more recent times. Uh, but is there anything you can share about uh, you know, who we knew as Dean Ship or Dr. Ship that happened maybe before he was Dr. Ship? Any good stories about him? Uh... Not too many I can tell publicly. Uh, I, I was afraid of that. Yes. Okay. Um, no, I think Mel. You know, Mel was a um, Mel was an interesting guy. I mean, Mel was the gentleman's gentleman, I believe. You know, uh, mm -hmm. and he still is. For that yeah. um, uh, Very steadfast. Very dedicated. Um, and I know as we as we traveled, you know, throughout the South, you know, we uh, we got to really appreciate. Uh, each other. I remember um, sitting down with him on many occasions, just having common com um, com conversations. But early on, um, his family lived here as well. You know, his, his father, his mother, uh, his, his sister. And I never forget. Uh, I forget. Uh, this was bit, must have been maybe during our undergrad uh, time. But his sister was having a was was uh, playing in a power puff football game. You know, and Mel, Mel convinced me to go go with him to watch his sister play this powder puff puff game. So I became relatively close, you know, to, to the family. Uh, his father, I still see his father occasionally, uh, Gene Ship, uh, Sergeant Gene Ship, uh, who's over 100. Uh, but, you know, being able to have, see a family, an African-American family in Bloomington that I could somewhat uh, identify with, uh, I found that relatively comforting, you know, to be invited over to the house for uh, a backyard barbecue, uh, example. I mean, this was something that um, I, had, I did not have, you know, once I came, once I left New Jersey and, 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 came, and came to Bloomington. So in a way, his family was somewhat of, and I want to say my family, but at least it provided the semblance of a family unit for me um, during those early days of, of, of my time here in Bloomington. 
Well, that was probably part of your support system then as well, I'm sure. So, uh, is it a fluke that both of you ended up in the public health arena? I don't know. You know, um, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I think I'm trying to remember the, the, the time sequence. Uh, I think Mel got his MPH before mine. I think I followed him. Um, but my decision, I think, to, 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 to go that route, you know, predated when I actually ended up in Chapel Hill. I started out, uh, but before I, before I went to Chapel Hill, um, I applied, to, applied locally to the Masters, of, I think it was the Masters in Public Administration program, thinking that might satisfy my, 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 my itch, uh, but it didn't. I took a couple of courses and didn't, didn't, but I wanted something that was going to be somewhat convenient for me and not having to, 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 to um, stop everything here and go somewhere else. So I realized that uh, that was not going to get it. So it took me a little, it took me some, some years thereafter in order to, uh, you know, get the, to apply for the sabbatical and then actually, you know, go um, to Chapel Hill. But no, I, I think a lot of it may have, you know, may have to do with uh, the way we think and, and, and how we feel about, you know, society at large and, and what we see our mission uh, is as, as, as public servants. Um, I think the fact that not only we both ended up in public health, we both, you know, we're in academia, uh, we share some similar awards. Uh, so there, there, there's several parallels there uh, between, you know, Mel and I. And again, you know, not in terms of being competitive, it's just, you know, I think that's the way uh, our careers evolved. Well, it's interesting. We always kidded him when he was here at Ohio State because he had gotten that doctorate in public health from the university up there in Michigan. And we don't right. mention its you know, real name or anything, but, you know, that school up north. And um, he always just took, you know, he was uh, good natured about it. And we just teased him about it. But, uh, you know, both of you have had very storied careers and uh, certainly have been great uh, servants to the profession. And we're just grateful for that. Well, tell us a little bit about your family. Um. Well, basically, right now it's it's me and my two, my twin daughters. Um, um, I'm twice divorced, um, but uh, luckily, uh, out of my second marriage, you know, came came uh, two lovely uh, ladies, um, uh, both on on the East Coast now. Uh, one is a physician assistant, the other is a uh, flight attendant uh, for for Delta. Um, in fact, she was, she told me she said, "Dad, I want to travel the world." And you can't fault me because I came by it. I came by it uh, naturally, uh, so she's 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 enjoying her, her life. So um, that's 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 kind of more my immediate family. I think um, I look at my you know, close friends as more of an extended family. But um, I lost my mother a couple of years ago. Uh, my father uh, a few years be, uh, before that. But you know, she was ninety four uh, when, when she passed, so you know she's had a, you know a pretty a pretty good 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 life. Um, and I think you know if, if I had to look back uh, over my life, um, if there's one thing that I probably would maybe try to do a little bit differently would would have been to spend a little bit more time you know at home. Uh, I think you know having that drive, that passion um, to do more, um, kind of led me somewhat astray in terms of um, being the, the, the type of family person that I probably should have been, I, I would have loved to uh, have been. And so that, that kind of haunts me uh, today. Um, and again, I mean, I, I, uh, my, my daughter's turned out well, uh, unfortunately, you know, um, uh, not having, you know, Two successful marriages, I think, uh, did not turn out well. But I never forget when I was in, when I was at Chapel Hill, we had a seminar, and we often invited in some of the icons in the public health to just come and just talk with us. And it was six of us, I, no, nine of us, I believe, in my, in my cohort. Um, and we always would ask them um, at the end of the uh, in, in the discussion, "What's your major regret?" And I think the majority of them would come up with the same sort of answer, maybe a different variation on it, but same sort of answer in that, you know, not spending the time, you know, at family with, with family that they should have, uh, you know, being out there trying to chase those windmills um, and as, as often as, as they could 
and and not not doing the same thing, you know, uh, at home. So I think I'm, I'm the same way. I think um, I would rather I, I I would rather have been able to kind of allocate my time in a much more family oriented uh, manner. No grandchildren yet. No, no. Um, I don't I don't know why. You know, my my daughters are both, both still single. You know, they're 40 years old. They're still single. Um, and they seem to be in, enjoying what it is they do. You know, I, I ask them uh, occasionally how things are going. Uh, I thought uh, we had, there, was, there were several moments uh, along the way where we thought that uh, there may be an engagement uh, or two. But uh, I think my daughters uh, kind of like me in a certain way that they, they can get bored very easily. <laughs> and uh, so they, they, they still, they, they seem to be happy. And that's the main thing. And I tell them, and I often tell them that, you know, you have to decide what's best for you, you know, and don't try to live your life for others. Uh, you know, I'm going to support you in, in, in whatever it is, you know, that you uh, decide to do. I think that's wise counsel. The grandchildren are the best. Okay. Yeah. So uh, no doubt about that. I told Dr. Zadnick that a number of years ago, and she's finally come to that realization. <laughs> and shared with me the other night, hey, that, you are absolutely right. That's great. So it's, uh, they're, they're wonderful, wonderful things to have in your life. So what thoughts or words would you have for the, prof for the profession in this time that seems so chaotic um, that, um, you know, we have division within the country on a variety of issues and everything. Are there thoughts or words you would have for the profession at this point in our, in our history? If we look at what it is that we purport to be and to do. If we, we go back to our optometric oath, uh, beyond that to the Hippocratic oath and think about why we are what we are. You know, we are in fact public servants and, pub and being a public servant carries responsibilities, you know, beyond just, you know, seeing our patients in the exam room, but it carries responsibilities to be leaders, um, to be educators, to be catalysts for um, change, for uh, the well-being of society at large. And I would love to see the profession, you know, be, you know, that leader, be that catalyst, be out there in the forefront, um, helping, helping kind of um, bring our country, you know, back to, uh, together, uh, to, I mean, you know, they, 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 there's so much divisiveness, you know, right now um, that uh, it's going to take all of us, I think, working together uh, along a common path uh, to try to bring about the type of change that we need to do. You know, it's going to take a lot of healing. Um, you know, the, the history of our country, uh, I mean, it's, it's great in many respects, but not so great in other respects. Mm -hmm. And I think those other respects still linger in the minds of many individuals. And so we have to uh, find a way to get beyond that, to, 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 to address it uh, to, and, 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 and then to, to, to move on, uh, to move on in a, in, in a positive way. So we have to kind of stand up and be leaders uh, in the community, in our, in our respective communities um, and kind of, you know, be out there helping to educate people about what is right, you know, what, what, what is the right path uh, going, going forward? How can we improve uh, the health of all humanity? I think one of the reasons that I gravitated to public health, you know, is because of the fact that we think we, the things of, of health, you know, not just, you know, medicines and, and, and uh, dealing with, you know, looking inside, you know, some, somebody's eye, you know, uh, for, for disease, but it looks at health in terms of a much more holistic uh, manner, in terms that we have to be healthy from a mental as well as a physical um, perspective. We have to be, be healthy uh, as we live, as we work, and as we play within our respective communities. And the only way we can, we can do that um, is to make sure that we are equitable as, as best as we, we can in terms of making sure that everyone has a free opportunity, you know, to that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Wise counsel. And I think that's why you're considered one of the statesmen of the profession right there. So, I don't know about all of that, but... Well, I, I'm just telling you how it is, I think. 
Um, what would you tell someone who's still in optometry school or very early in their career who aspires to have a career much like yours? What would you, how would you instruct them? How would you guide them? What counsel would you give them? I have often been asked that question. In fact, um, when I was vice president uh, at IU, um, I had quite a few students come into my office because being a being being a being an Indiana University vice president uh, also I think helped increase the visibility of optometry for a lot of individuals because they they, they knew me as a vice president, but they also said, "Hey, he's also an optometrist." So I had several students come into me to come into my office, and they were more curious about how I got to be a vice president more so than optometry, but that, 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 that gave me kind of a, an entree to talk about optometry as well. And I often, again, reflected back upon my career, you know, as being totally serendipitous. I mean, from the time I uh, decided to come to Indiana University, uh, all the way through um, serving as a vice president, every decision, though, was one that I did not anticipate, I did not expect, um, and it just happened to, 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 to show up. So what I tell students is that you never know who's looking, who's watching. You never know what opportunities are going to be out there. Um, there, there are things that will occur in the future that you can't even imagine at this moment in time. Uh, but you want to be able to kind of peek around the corner and see what's there. But the best thing to do, I go back to my old Boy Scout model, you know, be prepared. Uh, prepare yourself in a way that when opportunities come your way, you're able to take advantage of them if you want to. I had a close friend who always tell me, you know, it's about access. You don't necessarily have to access every opportunity that comes your way, but at least have the ability or the opportunity to make that decision yourself. So if you prepare yourself and when those who you don't see are looking at you for various opportunities, uh, you're able to make that decision whether you want to go that path or, or, or not. And I think, uh, to me, that's probably um, the, the best advice I can give. Because, again, you know, we don't know the future. Um, and a lot of professions that, a lot of uh, occupations that exist today won't, won't exist in the future. But also, car, the corollary to that, there'll be a whole host of new occupations, a whole host of new opportunities out there. And so you want to be able to be able to say, yes, uh, that's, that's something I want, I want to pursue. But you have to be prepared in order to be able to do that. Um, so always, uh, always walk and act like, hey, uh, somebody is looking at me. Um, I think uh, Quincy Jones once told me. He says, you know, always, you know, go out, laugh, dance, you know, like 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 like, like no one's watching, you know. Um, and I think uh, that's 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 probably what I would say. Well, it's interesting. We have uh, students who rotate through our practice and. Uh, we have a number of them that end up, you know, in a program here at Ohio State getting, getting a concurrent master's degree along with their OD degree. I always point out to them just exactly what you're saying. And there are, in that, there are opportunities that will come to them because of that master's degree, uh, usually a master's of science, that are not available to me, uh, having only an OD degree. And similarly, there are opportunities that have come to you because you pursued the MPH, and that was a passion of yours that wouldn't be available to the normal optometrist who had not done those things. So I think having having skill sets that are a little unique and then being available for some of those opportunities is a great thing. So you mentioned a scouting career. Were you involved in scouts as a child? Yeah, I was a Boy Scout. And what rank did you finally get to? Oh, I forget. Um, I forget where, where I ended up. Uh, I was a Cub Scout and a Boy Scout. Okay. Um, but I forget the rank now. That's all right. But interesting. The um, the Boy Scouts they had a um, I forget what it was called, but it was a, I think it was a, a major jamboree here in Bloomington some years ago, and uh, I was contacted because they wanted to have a health component. So I was contacted to put on the health component for this major Boy Scout you know jamboree. And again, you know that was another uh, exposure opportunity. Right. you know, for, for optometry. And I know, you know, we, we all very, very busy individuals, but sometimes, you know, uh, we just can't say no, you know, we have to kind of, and I think one of my major faults throughout life is not knowing that no word. Um, and I'm, I'm getting a little bit better at it, but in retirement, but 
Um, and sometimes I think, you know, that exhausts us uh, to, to the point where we kind of uh, give short strift to, to, to some of the other things, you know, we should be uh, paying, paying attention to. But, you know, when these opportunities exist that, that you can go out and help um, increase the level of knowledge uh, about the profession, about optometry, uh, about you know the benefits of being an optometrist and 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 how and how you can serve the needs of, of people. You know we need to avail ourselves of those opportunities. Opportunities and each of us, you know, I think have a role to play in, in doing that. So uh, going back to your question earlier about um, what can the profession do to help increase you know representation, it's it's just that you know as we interact with individuals, you know, always talk about. What it is that you know that you do, and 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 the benefits that it, it does, the benefits it provides in terms of service service to others. Very good. So that concludes the questions that I have, Dr. Marshall. And so we've got a few questions from uh, some folks that you know uh, who uh, who have uh, shared some thoughts uh, here that they'd like to have some uh, answers to questions for you. Um, uh, and Dr. Jackie Davis, who I know you know, uh, has uh, shared some questions. I don't think she's sending softballs to you. She's got good questions for you. Uh, she wants to know, what are your thoughts about the 2% representation of African-American ODs in the overall ranks of U.S. ODs? You talked a little bit about that, but any other thoughts about that? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, that 2%, you know, has not, has not wavered over the years. Um, now, going back, when I first came into the profession, uh, I did a little study, and I think we had oh, maybe a little over 100 African-American ODs that I could identify at the time. Uh, you know, we've gone a little bit beyond that, but the profession has also grown. So percent-wise, uh, you know, we have really not moved up. Um, and when we look at, you know, I mean, if you look at females, for example, I think there, were, there was one in my class. And now, what, about 60% female, I think, in, in, um, in the schools. And soon, uh, it'll be a female majority, I think, in, in the profession at, at large. Um, if I look at the Latinx population, uh, you know, we, we, we're, we're seeing growth there. You know, again, you know, not, not necessarily to where it should be, but we are seeing uh, much more significant growth than we've seen with the African-American population. So... My, what, what I think about that two percent, I think it's it's, it's 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 drastically low. It's embarrassingly low. Um, and as we look at the population at large, as it becomes more and more diverse, it's creating more and more challenges in terms of what happens when you have a discordant discordant relationship between the doctor and the patient in terms of uh, cultural identity, cultural understanding, cultural appreciation. Uh, being able to uh, interact with those patients in a patient-centered uh, manner. Uh, we need people who can uh, understand that and be able to translate uh, that into effective you know, um, uh, exam and treatment uh, modalities. I think too often um, our our, our, our internal baggage, you know, from our, you know, from our lived experiences may get, into the, get, get in the way as we make decisions about, about patient care. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, I think, in my presentation um, uh, next week. But uh, if we do not understand uh, or we tend to um, look at people in a way that it, imply, it, 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 it impacts our decision making in a negative way. Uh, give you an example. Um, I often, I, I kind of coined this phrase across the room diagnosis. So if I'm seeing a new patient, and as soon as I encounter that patient, I, I'm going to make an across the room diagnosis about that individual based upon how they look, how they walk, how they dress, how they talk. Um, you know, so if I see an African American, I may start thinking in terms of you know glaucoma or hypertension, or diabetic eye disease. Now that's that's a good place to start, but it's not a place you want to end up. I mean, you want you want to start the conversation with that, but you also want to be able to engage the patient in a conversation that will allow you to, to come up with the best treatment modality uh, available. And too often, I think um, when if there's an implicit bias 
uh, there, then we tend to, uh, we may tend to dominate the conversation as, as, as providers, dominate the conversation to a point where we don't really hear the patient's story and we don't really apply what the patient is trying to tell us or wants to tell us uh, to an effective uh, outcome. So I think uh, we need to have, we, we got to have greater diversity within the profession, uh, particularly around African-American population. Uh, we got to be able to address things like you know, implicit bias. Uh, we have to be able to make sure that uh, our lived experiences, our internal baggage, and we all have, we all have biases, you know, regardless, you know, but, but not all biases are negative either. Uh, but, but those negative biases can, it can in fact get in the way, and many times they get in the way because of cultural differences and, and, and racial differences and ethnic differences. Um, so I think the more diversity we have in the profession, uh, the better we are going to be able to address, you know, those differences in a positive manner. This question comes from Dr. Uh, Justin Manning, and uh, Dr. Manning wants to know, he says, I recently gave a CA lecture on population health and raised a 2015 study that showed most providers hold some level of implicit bias against POCs which caused some controversy with the attendees. He says, given your experience, how do we raise awareness of this, both in optometry school and with current providers, as we work to create more equitable health, health outcomes? Well, you know, it's a very good observation. I think, I think, you know, there are data out there that will show that. Um, but I think too often we get, we get defensive. So if someone told me that I'm biased, uh, I may get defensive about that. No, I'm not biased. But the, the, the thing about implicit bias is that we don't know that we are biased. You know, we, we may be acting in a way that, that, that we don't recognize as being biased. And, and I think that's, that's, that's a difficulty because what happens is that the way we act out may be differently than the way we think. And, you know, that's the nature of implicit bias. So if I tell someone that, you know, you, you have these biases, um, yeah, sure. You know, they, they, they might go on the defense and says, no, I don't. You know, I, I, I deplore, you know, any sort of bias. But by your actions or by the way you look or by the way your mannerisms, all that may translate into some sort of microaggression that's, that's interpreted differently by the person you're talking to uh, than, than what you, 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 you intend. So... Uh, something like the implicit uh, bias association test is a way of trying to um, reveal or, or disclose, you know, those subtle biases that we may harbor that we may may not be aware of. Uh, but I've seen I've seen situations where an individual, you know, has has made has made a statement and really had you know had no intention of of, of saying anything negatively. But the way that statement was, was phrased or presented was received by an individual as being totally negative. And so we have to be able to understand these, these, uh, these choices you know, that we make and be able to try to catch them beforehand. And the only way we can do that is to kind of look inwardly and try to recon acknowledge them, reconcile them, and address them uh, beforehand. But, but going back to that study, yes, um, I've seen some of the studies uh, that show the healthcare providers, uh, particularly in terms of dealing with African American populations, uh, tend to harbor uh, certain biases and will act differently, uh, will communicate differently, and oftentimes that will lead to a different outcome. Well, thank you for that. This question comes from a good friend of yours, Dr. Sandy Block, and uh, she says the COVID-19 pandemic has brought public health to the center of all of our lives. It's created a great deal of angst within the world, has created challenges in the delivery of all aspects of health, especially the underserved and vulnerable. How do we engage more optometry students to become active in the public health arena, including completing a master's in public health, or I suppose even a doctorate in public health, especially when the final financial rewards don't really match the needs or the efforts. Thanks, Andy. Um, 
So you thought I was the only one that was going to give you tough questions. Right, right. You know, we brought in some people to ask really tough questions as well. You know what? I you know when, when when I was teaching public health in the early days, public health was always thought of as, excuse me, but poor people's health, and it was it was not looked at um, in the in the in, in the in the entire sort of gestalt that that it should it should have been it been viewed. Um, it was thought of, you know, not being able to make a lot of money, not a lot of opportunity out there. But I think it's quite the contrary. But public health is so diverse. Public health is so expansive. It, it, it cuts across so many different disciplines. Um, one can be uh, an optometrist and a public health practitioner at the same time and, and, and do things that uh, they would not be able to do otherwise, as, as you mentioned, mentioned earlier. In terms of the economic side of that, um, there are no limits. Uh, I mean, sure, now sure, there are there are positions that pay less than other positions, but depending upon what one wants to do, uh, there are opportunities out there that that will. I, I know public health people who, who make very good salaries um, by virtue of of, of, of their uh, occupation. So, I wouldn't let that necessarily be a, a, a negative. I think what we have to do is to. Uh, kind of do a better job of um, articulating, you know, that optometry oath, optometric oath into clinical practice. You know, the fact that, you know, we have to make sure that we are about improving the health of all humanity. And the eye is just one part of that uh, effort. Um, and that a person who has vision problems, but lives in an area that, uh, that has all sorts of obstacles to 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 uh, being able to uh, ambulate safely. Um, uh, a person who who has uh, diabetic eye disease and lives in an area that has a few food deserts, um, you know, all of these contribute to health. You know, we know that uh, only about twenty percent of our of our health is attributable to to healthcare. Uh, the rest of it has to do with, you know, the environment, uh, has to do with uh, a whole host of other things that, 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 that play upon uh, our daily lives. Again, where we live, where we work, where, where we play. And so as true health care providers, if we really embrace the term health, going back to looking beyond, you know, uh, the, the, the treatment of disease, but also looking at the physical and the mental, you know, well-being. Public health is at the core of all of that. So if you really want to be a true health care provider, then you have to go beyond, you know, that exam room. You have to be able to be out there um, supporting health at the level of the community and the level of the population. I've got two more questions that were typed in. These are both from Dr. Davis, and I'm going to kind of pull them together because they're, they're kind of similar, but a little bit different. Um, First, what national health care policies do you think will impact the future of optometry? And then a little bit differently, but similar kind of thing. What social determinant of health do you think has the greatest impact on people in vulnerable populations? So health care policies will affect the profession. And then social determinants of health have the greatest impact on health of, vul of vulnerable populations. Well, I think in terms of health health policy, uh, we have to make sure that optometry um, is part of the agenda. Uh, one of um, going back to uh, one, 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 of, one of my one of my legacies and proudest moments was when I was invited to serve on the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine uh, committee that produced a document looking at optometry as a population health um, uh, imperative, and that whole document was about making sure that optometry is elevated to the public discourse around health, that uh, it's part of the national agenda for health. Um, we know that, you know, vision care, vision problems, you know, exist as chronic diseases, um, but yet, you know, they will not appear, you know, too often on the agenda for addressing um, uh, health care at, at large. So in terms of a policy, we, 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 need to, we need to have a policy. And I think that that document, uh, the, the Nason report, uh, identifies several um, potential 
policy interventions that might help elevate optometry, you know, to that uh, level of, of a national uh, agenda. And I think uh, if we do that, you know, if, if, we, if, we, if we attend to, 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 to those recommendations, those nine recommendations in that report, uh, I think that will help give us the type of, of, of perspective, national perspective, that will allow us to do what it is that we need to do to be more effective in, in delivering um, care, uh, I envision care uh, for, for our population. Now how, now, how do we frame that in terms of an actual document? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of, you know, beyond my thinking at, at, the, at the moment. But I think in terms of just some of the salient issues that we can focus on are, are probably easily identified, you know, in referring back to that Mason um, report. In terms of social determinants of health, um, I think, you know, one of the things I'm going to talk about um, next week um, is uh, the role that racism plays as a social determinant of health. And we don't normally think of it as a social determinant of health, but it is. It is. Because there's so many things that have evolved because of the racism that have uh, created, um, created an environment that is toxic, essentially. And um, that toxic environment translates into all sorts of unhealthy situations. Uh, not only in terms from, from the environmental level as, as to where we live, but even down to the cellular level. Um, you know, there's something referred to as the allostatic load, which are the physiological changes that uh, occur uh, within us um, as we encounter day-to-day -day discriminations, you know, that, 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 and that then in turn leads to uh, various types of systemic you know, uh, morbidities. So to me, that's a major social determinant of health, uh, but it's one that's not often looked at as, as, as such. You know, we often think about, again, um, you know, socioeconomic status, for example, you know, how, much we, um, how much money we make, where we live, uh, and, and those, those are true. But even if we dealt with those, in fact, you know, there are studies that will show also that even when a person has reached a certain level of social economic success, they still are subjected to racist practices. And those practices have adverse effects on, the, on their health. So um, controlling for everything else <clears throat> until, until we address Excuse me. Until we address, you know, that um, we're not going to have, um, I think, true equity across across the healthcare uh, domains. So those are the questions that people had sent in, and we're go we got maybe about five minutes left. And I want to just give anybody an opportunity to ask a question now. Uh, Dr. Marshall, you don't know this, but there's one one of our fac former faculty members has been in all of our interviews and really always has a question for the uh, interviewee. And that's uh, your good friend, Dr. Bob Newcomb, who uh, has his mic off already. So I'm just wondering if he has a question for you or not. As a matter of fact, I do. First of all, Ed, I, I want to congratulate you on the, on the Myers Lecture Award. That's an outstanding achievement. And in preparation for this, I was reading my favorite textbook last night that you and I co-edited back in 1990. And in this book, you wrote the chapter on health manpower, now called health person power. And I wondered what your feelings were about the number of new schools and do we need more ODs or less ODs? And, uh, and things have certainly changed since you wrote that chapter in 1990. Uh, very, very true, Bob. It's nice to see you. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think, I've started on several committees of the, AO, of the AOA and, and others, you know, looking at this whole issue around uh, human resources with uh, the workforce, you know, within eye care. And I think, you know, the, the profession has changed so much uh, in terms of skill up practice from the time I wrote that chapter um, that requires probably maybe uh, a larger workforce than we, have, we envisioned at, at that time. But also, um, we've gotten a lot more efficient as well. 
So we have to kind of reconcile, re reconcile those efficiencies um, with uh, the, the expansion of, of, of scope. But in terms of new schools, um, I think you know it, it's nice to see the profession develop but we have to be cautious, you know. Um, if we go back to, I forget, Bob, it was probably back in, what, the uh, maybe 70s, I think it was uh, dentistry uh, that decided to cut back on the schools uh, because they, 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 they were able for seeing kind of some, some of, a, of a potential glut out there. Um, now, they may have done it for other reasons, too. Um, but we have to be very, very careful that we don't necessarily overpopulate. But you know, every time we look at a man, a new, a new manpower workforce study, uh, and we go back 30, 40 years, and every about every 10 years there was a new study. One study was says, you know, we have too many. The next study, we don't have enough. Next study, we have too many. Next stuff, we, next study, we, we don't have enough. So we've seen this kind of cyclic sort of change uh, in terms of uh, what we really need. I think a lot of well. I think some of the schools um, have come on 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 online because they realize that you know, you know, there are some opportunities out there, financial opportunities, you know, for the institution. Um, you know, there was a book that came out again. I forget maybe sixties or seventies, uh, the corporatization of healthcare, where the, the 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 bottom line was that someone discovered there was money to be made in healthcare, and I think. Uh, what we are seeing is that, you know, there's money to be made in optometry and optometry education. Now, that's not to say that, you know, these schools are all bad. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but we have to be cautious as we develop new schools and bring them online to make sure that, you know, we have the resources to support those schools. Faculty, you know, uh, are we producing enough individuals to support them in terms of, of, of teaching? Um, do we have the, you know, the, the, the clinical resources um, and, 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 and other, and, and other uh, attributes that's going to make those, uh, make those new institutions, you know, success, successful. Now, uh, some of them, are, as I understand, are focusing on, you know, uh, underserved populations, and that's good, but we all should be doing that, you know, so that, should, that shouldn't necessarily be a mission of one school, you know, I think, and we all need to look at at, at, at uh, doing a better job in serving popula uh, populations who, who are most vulnerable. Um, I haven't really analyzed the numbers recently, um, but I think that uh, if we look at the number of optometrists per, per unit population, um, I think we have seen a, a somewhat of a drastic change in that ratio from, from, from the time I did that one chapter to where we are now. Um, but again, when I think when I, when I did that chapter, I believe uh, I may have talked in terms of a, a shortage, a potential shortage. Mm -hmm. So what is the proper ratio of ODs to the population today? I'm not really sure. You know, we go back to the, that, that one to 7,000 that we all were, were taught, well, you and I were taught anyway, uh, back in those days. You know, that goes back to a Bertrand and Elliott study, you know, a time and motion study, you know, that but so things were times were a lot different than they are now, um, and so I don't think it's it's it's, it's you know any longer uh, applicable you know to where we are now. So I think what we need to do is really get down and maybe do another one of those and see what is it that we what is the ideal number or range that we need to have in terms to be able to uh, sufficiently uh, and effectively you know service our, our populations. But again. We have to stratify populations because not all populations are the same. You know, we aren't we aren't we aren't universally you know afflicted with various types of, of vision care anomalies. So, do we need we need do we need more optometrists in certain areas than other areas? Probably so. And, and how do we go about reconciling that against some sort of you know magical um, ratio out there? Uh, one of the problems that we had was that you know the the distribution, not only the number but the distribution or the maldistribution. Now, luckily, optometry was usually much more, much better distributed than ophthalmology in terms of providing care to uh, vulnerable uh, populations, and, and, and that, that's, that's a very good, good, good thing. But we still know that there are populations out there who are underserved, 
and how do we go about addressing them? So it's not only looking at the, the, the number and the new schools, but where are these students, where are these new graduates going to practice? Are they going into, you know, the um, very qualified health center, for, for example? You know, they tend to serve populations uh, that, that generally are, in fact, uh, underserved. Uh, so are they really making a difference? Will they really make a difference in terms of effecting a change in the eye and vision status of the population in the future? And I think those are some of the questions we really have to answer. But um, I, I, lately, I try to stay out of the you know, discussions about, you know, is, it a, is it a good thing or a bad thing in terms of, of new schools? Because I think there are others who can better articulate that you know, than me. Uh, but I think there are questions that we have to ask uh, that are very, very relevant you know, to, those, to those sorts of decisions. And those are some of the questions I kind of uh, threw out here a few moments ago. One of the points uh, brought up by Dr. Zadnik is in the chat here, I'll just bring forward to you because you're probably not reading them. Uh, she just makes the point that the supply of applicants, and that is uh, a robust, qualified, diverse applicant pool has to be included in the calculation. So even if we had spaces for 4,000 students a year, you got to have 4,000 qualified applicants and that we shouldn't be just graduating 4,000 to graduate 4,000. And uh, uh, we're not doing the profession, we're not doing the world of service by just graduating that number. And Dr. Yeah. Don Moody has an interesting question. And we're going to make this one the final question to kind of keep within our time constraints. Uh, he says, do you think the location of an optometry program has an effect on the local or the regional public health? And if so, where would you like to see another program? Um, I think yes. Um, because there tends to be a concentration of services in that area. Um, and so I think that tends to um, have a certain reach into those communities that, that, may, that may not have been served uh, uh, historically. So I think, yes, I think, I think they, that, that does have an effect upon the public health of that community. Um, but again, we have to make sure that the students also are being trained to think that way, to think in terms of population health. Um, you know, I always had struggles, and Bob, you may you know, you know, you know, help me with this. You know, I always had, when I was teaching public health, trying to convince those students that public health was something they need to be concerned about uh, was always a challenge. And I think we've done a better job now because when, when, again, when I was doing that and Bob and I were kind of in our heyday, you know, we could probably count the MPHs on, on, on one hand. You know, now we have a lot more, I sorry, and I think in public health has gotten to be a lot more uh, visible. Uh, I, I, think, I think COVID has really also, I hate to use the word help, but kind of assisted you know, that to a certain degree. Um, but we, we want to make sure that the students are prepared mentally to think in terms of population health. Um, and so when, when we do place schools in various communities um, and they go out and service those, those individuals, that they're just, just not looking at that individual as a, as a single individual, but thinking of them as part of a, of a larger population uh, that needs certain services that may go beyond what they have been trained to do clinically. Uh, and I think that's where you know, public health um, comes into play. Where should we place these? Um, you know, I, the, uh, the Black Eye Care Perspectives movement has been talking about you know, looking at maybe a, put, putting a school at an HBCU, a historically black college and university. Um, I think that might you know, be a good thing in a way because um, if number one, it might help increase the number of, you know, increase the diversity within the profession, but also I think will create a, a mindset within a larger diverse population about the importance um, of eye health, of proper um, eye health. And, you know, when we talk about, when go, we're going back to why is diversity important uh, in terms of, of, uh, of healthcare, we know that, you know, 
many patients tend to fare better when they are served by someone who looks like them, talks like them, acts like them, um, than they are otherwise. You know, so when, when there's a concordance between provider um, and patient. So having a, a body of students being trained around a culture of health, to, to take, 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 take a phrase from Robert Wood Johnson, around a culture of health, um, and then take that with them out into the community, I think would be uh, a good thing. So I would say, yeah, let, let me maybe look at an area that has a greater opportunity for serving a larger population of those who traditionally are in need of those services. Now, in that, in that location, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know offhand, I think, you know, we will have to look and see, you know, what area might be best able to, 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 to service them in terms of, of resources. But so I think, I think uh, from, a, from a very generic perspective, uh, being able to uh, being able to place them in an area that's, that's going to have the greatest need would be uh, something to look at. I think, that, I, think, I think that's a very interesting perspective, and that could be a, a benefit for, for everybody, not only the local community, but also the profession at large in terms of, of diversity. I think that would be a positive. Ed, when I went to public health, health, I offered... Newton's I offered my students $100 if, to the ones that would get an MPH degree after, after they graduated. I only had one student take me up on that offer, and that's Dr. Justin Manning, who's on the program. So, Justin, I, I know I still owe you $100. <laughs> well, well, thanks. I, I appreciate that, Bob. And I, I, I count that as a very, very important award to uh, receive from you. <laughs> very much so. It, it bothers me. It's been this long. and no, we still haven't made it happen. We're going to find a time for that IOU to be cashed in. And I think it's gathering interest, Justin, personally, but, you know, you should be tracking that. Fair enough. I, I, I'm not going to you know, disagree with that. <laughs> but, but, but Bob, you know, one thing I have found is that even though I may have had um, difficulty sometimes convincing students when they were in the class that public health is important, I don't know how many times after they've graduated and gotten out in the field, I get phone calls and emails about how do I do this or how, how can I handle that? Mm -hmm. So it eventually kind of develops traction eventually. Yep. So we have to have hope. <laughs> well, Dr. Marshall, we appreciate your time and your, uh, your sharing this afternoon. It's been uh, insight insightful, a lot of wisdom and uh, a lot of statesmanship, if you will. I, you know, we just really appreciate your, your your opinions and your thoughts on things. Uh, we're grateful for uh, that, and we're grateful for those of you who have participated uh, in the uh, webinar. Uh, Dr. Uh, Marshall will be doing the Myers Lecture on Wednesday, November 4th, 5.30 p.m. Uh, it will be also be a, uh, a Zoom-style webinar, and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say that evening and lighten us even more. So uh, thank you to everyone. Congratulations again to you, Dr. Marshall. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say next week. Thank you, Jeff and Carla. Thank you as well.